Guys, would you grab a Bible and open up to James chapter 4? It's where we're going to be this morning. We're continuing verse by verse, making our way through this book. Hope is that you got a Bible and you made your way there. If you don't have a Bible, we've provided them, metal cubbies around you. Grab one from underneath. Join us here in James 4 so that God's Word would be just laid out to you both by hearing and seeing and just everywhere that it would just come and into work into your heart. We're just inviting you that you would fully just be pursuing that this morning. So with Bibles open, let's take a moment and ask God that He would do that in us, that He would grant us favor to hear from Him. Would you join me right now in prayer? God, we've opened up Bibles. Now would you open up our hearts? Would you cause it to be so that we would be receptive to you this morning? Would you lead us and guide us so that your truth would be known to us, that we would understand, that we could comprehend what you have for us? But Lord, I I pray for more than comprehension. I pray for transformation. I pray that you would just change and be working that work inside of us, that today it would be altogether real and authentic, that you would be at work in our lives just in a very personal way so that we would know that this morning you have spoken to us. Would you make that just where we are? Give us hearts to hear from you today. We ask for it together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, with one week till Christmas, I am certain it's probably happening for most of you. Somewhere, somehow, there is a recipe that is being worked out into your your lives. Maybe it's a cookie that you love, or maybe it's getting ready for the season. Maybe it's a, a cider that you have. Some of you, you know, you have those secret recipes that you don't share with anybody. It's like, it's just, just only you know. Others of you, it's a famous recipe you copy, but it's one that probably you delight in. Even if you don't do the cooking, you might be, yeah, make that. <laughs> I love that recipe, that one right there. That's, I love that. I mean, I just want you to know we understand how that works, right? Well, I want you to think that through for a moment because as we're thinking about recipes, I want to tell you that God has given us a recipe for humility. That's where we are right now in the book of James. We're in a section where that's what we're looking at, and I want to tell you it's something you want because God tells us it's right there. It is upon the humble that God pours out His abundant and amazing and overflowing grace And and it's one of those things that we need to think, okay, that's what I want. I draw your attention to that, and many of you guys know, because we're working through James, but over the last few weeks, we've kind of done a series within a series. Though we're working through James, we've kind of done a four-week series, this being the fourth and last of that, where we've been considering this incredible thing that God describes as humility and and what He has for us. It began for us back in verse 6. Why don't you go back there and notice it with me? It begins with there, it says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud. He gives grace. In fact, not just grace, more grace. The idea is grace upon grace, abundant grace, where God's blessings are pouring out. He says, here's where my blessings pour out. It's on the humble. It's on the humble. Now, that should at least pique our interest, like, okay, well, that, that is something I want. I do want God's blessings. I do want what He would have. I mean, I, I, I would like, I mean, yeah, who wouldn't? But then he ends it, go down to verse 10. It says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Humble yourself under God in the sight of the Lord. That's where He ends, and as He lays this out to us, there is a sense that I've wanted you to see. There's a beginning in verse 6, and He brings it up here in verse 10, and as He's doing so, He again just lays it as clear as He can as a piece of instruction, that He's telling you that this is something you need to do. Humble yourself. This is not something that's happening automatically. This is not something that I can do for you. This is something you need to do. It's not going to happen unless you do it. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. It's instruction. It's a, a place where he says, if you'll do that, if you will humble yourself under God, that is where God's grace 
would be poured out in your life. You would obtain the things that he would do. He would work that, but you need to do this. Well, we've been talking about that for four weeks because in part, I've brought before you that I'm not sure that we always understand what that actually looks like. Maybe, maybe you've been around church enough to know that humble is a good thing. That you're like, okay, you you do want humble. I mean, you're like, I I recognize that's like a positive characteristic. But if you're actually going to try to be humble, how do you actually do that? Do you like, you know, just sit there on your living room couch and just humble, 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 humble. Am I, did that work? You know, I mean, no, it's not actually going to work. I mean, it's not actually just by knowing the word nor recognizing its value. I want to tell you that's part of the problem. Like, how do you do that? But I think that's exactly what God gives us here in James. That beginning there in verse 6, moving down to verse 10, these two just verses almost being like bookends for us and that which lies in between is the how-to. Like, do this to get that. And in that, he gives us four things. Let's just go back and read them. We'll begin in verse 6 for the context. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, because that's true, number one, submit to God. Number two, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Number three, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Number four, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you. Yeah, that's where we've been. Hey, these are four things that God lays before us, and these actually are at least understandable, doable in the sense that God will help you do them, but these are things that if you want to be humble, you can do that. And I, again, want you to see it this morning almost as if God is presenting you a recipe. He's saying, if you want humility, these are the ingredients you pour into that. Pour these in. This is what will happen, and without these, you can't do it. Well, again, some of you guys have been with us, and so just a reminder, if you didn't, you can go back, catch these online, or get a CD or DVD, but as a quick reminder, let's just go over them. It says the first thing you're going to have to do is submit to God. You're going to have to come and put yourself and rank yourself under God, say to God, yes, <laughs> and, and that God, you're God and I'm not, and, 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 and just allow and, and put in a place where you would say your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, that's, that's the first part. But to do that, you're also going to have to do the second. You're going to have to resist the devil because every day he is attacking humility. Every day he is tempting and condemning, moving. And the only way to even get close to this is you're going to have to resist the devil. If you do, he'll flee from you. And through that, you can draw near to God. That's where we were last week, and in many ways, the height of it, because that's the main thing. I mean, that's what you've been created for. You will never be satisfied outside of a relationship with Him. And here's an incredible promise. If you would pursue that, if you would step towards that and draw near to Him, He will draw near to you. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. And with that, He now tells us what we need to do is to cleanse our our hands, that you and I are called to do that. So that's what we want to unpack for just a few moments and try to understand. So let's go back and read it again. Would you join me? You're there in James chapter 4. We're in verse 8, right in the middle of it, picking it up with the word cleanse. It says it this way, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. He lays this out to us, and if you're paying attention, you might just notice that the most words are used on this fourth one. I mean, the rest of them, I mean, they're there. Submit to God, just a few words. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you, right there. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. But when he gets to this fourth one, James gives us the longest explanation. There's probably a reason for that. Maybe, maybe of the four, it's the one that we would most easily overlook or want to go fast through. And yet I want to tell you it's exactly what we need in our lives. 
God is calling us to a place where you and I would cleanse our hands. Now, this is a reference that has some very deep and wonderful Old Testament Levitical pictures that are there. And to be honest, it would take a very long time for us to unpack all of that. I mean, it's amazing. And for some of you, you got it. And just that reminder that this is found in that significance would be helpful. But you know, I think we can get close to it. Not, not fully close to it, but I think we can get close enough for us this morning just to be very, very practical about it. That just to think about it practically, and I could get there by just asking you a question. How often do you wash your hands? Maybe I should say, how often should you wash your hands? You know who we're talking about there. Why? Why why is that? Because our hands get dirty. I mean, like all the time. I mean, if you do it right, it's like every day you are washing your hands multiple times a day. Multiple times, because you get, your hands get dirty, and there's a need there for that. And here's what I want you to understand. Spiritually, your need as equal, if not greater, much greater. That there would be a sense that what cleansing is, it should be as consistent as hand washing in our lives. We need this. In fact, hey, little bonus thought. Somebody may want to do that practically. Like, when you wash your hands, take a moment and ask God to just cleanse you spiritually. Just be, like, just be a powerful way. Just constantly make it a part of your life. Just to work it in there. But it does need to be a part of it. That God is telling us, hey, we need to do this. Why do we need to do this? Well, James just tells us why we need it. Read it again, middle of verse 8. Cleanse your hands. Notice, you sinners. Yeah, that's the problem. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We are sinners by nature. We are sinners by choice. We are sinners in word and action and thought. We are sinners. We sin accidentally at times. We sin through iniquity. We sin through transgression. I mean, the package is big, but the reality is there that that is who we are. It is because we are this that we we need this. We need this place where we need constantly to be cleaning our hands and be spiritually pursuing just that, that cleansing work. Now, we think about that, and in that picture, again, this is instruction. You need to do this. But I think it would be clear to understand, I mean, the real cleansing agent is Jesus. If you want to think about it in that kind of analogy, Jesus is the soap. He's even the water, you know, just pouring out there. I mean, we're just presenting ourselves. We're just putting our hands into the flow and saying, God, I need you to to wash me and make me clean. In fact, some have described this. We think about how this works, and we think about just this place of how that works, that we need to come and confess our sins. We need to just make that just a process in our lives. Some have described 1 John 1, 9 as the Christian bar of soap. It's a good little description. 1 John 1, 9 simply says it this way. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He says, if you'll just come, and you'll confess your sin. He is faithful. It always works. I mean, he cleanses us. He washes us. He forgives us of our sins and cleanses us of all unrighteousness. I mean, he's just telling us, hey, this is what you and I need to do. There's a cleansing that needs to take place. But it's more than just washing our hands because he adds another description, right? He says, not only cleanse your hands, but purify your hearts. Again, just so you see it in the text, middle of verse 8, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Our hearts, purifying our hearts, the idea is that we're pursuing not just the external, but the internal. We're dealing with the source of the problem. Our hands are our actions. They, They exemplify that which we do and the dirt that happens on the outside, but our hearts just picture the source. It's where Jesus would tell us, out of your heart flow all those things that that happen. Our heart is really the problem. And as we deal with our sin, Jesus is challenging us to do that. That God is telling you he's interested not only in just washing your hands, but working in your heart. Now, that's powerful, and we need that. We should pursue that. Think about it this way. Imagine, you know, you're kind of walking in, you walk into your kitchen, and you find just a a puddle of water or or stuff all over the floor, and you realize this is a mess. i got to clean this up. Let's say you do. You go in there and you you clean it up, you get out a mop, whatever, you clean it up. And then you come back an hour later and the puddle's there again. Well, if you're thinking clearly, if you didn't think about it the first time, you should think about it the second time like, 
okay, what in the world is causing this? I mean, it's like, this is not enough just to clean up the mess. There's a leak under the sink somewhere. There's, I mean, we just can't deal with the external. We're going to have to go in and find out what's broken. We need to go in underneath that and figure out what's producing this problem. And God's telling us that's what we need to do. What's the problem? What's the problem in your life and mind? Well, James tells us. Let's just read it. Middle of verse 8. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, because that's what we are. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Double-minded, it's a great description, and it's true. Of every Christian in this room, you are double-minded. We, we have a place where there's a, a battle happening inside us, where we, we have a, a place that's struggling. It gives it to us this way in Galatians chapter 5. It says, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. I mean, what an incredibly powerful description. He says, here's what's happening inside of you. If you're a Christian, you have a flesh that's inside of you, and you have the Spirit, and you know what? There's a conflict. It, there, there's a battle between these. And your problem is that you have a, you're, you're fighting both of them. You are double-minded, so that you know, you're working through this, and therein lies the problem, that if, if where sin is, is there, it's coming from this source in our lives. We find ourselves double-minded. Some would even say it's a picture of almost trying to ride two horses at the same time. It's like, it's not going to work. They don't do that. But you guys can think it through, right? I mean, it happens to us here in Roswell. You know how it works, right? You're driving down the road, and you got one of those squirrels that dart out inside of the road. And you're like, man, a lot of time. And they're, they're going to get right across the road. And then they stop. And then they run back the other way, and you're like, you, you, you shouldn't do that. And then you're like starting to like, okay, at least they're going to make it to this. Then they stop and do it all over again. They run, and you're, you're trying to commit suicide. Stop doing that. You're like, pick a right side. Go, go one way or the other. Don't just do this like back and forth and back. And That's double-minded. That's what happens to us. There's a place where we're in this struggle between the flesh and the spirit, and, and there's a sense of saying, okay, when, when that's happening, we need to recognize that. When we're going to God and we're needing God, I, need you, I, I just need to confess my sin. I've, I, I, I've been a grouch or I've, I, I've, I've been unkind and, and I just need your cleansing and that's a great thing to do. You just need to wash your hands and just pff, right there and then go, you know what? The, but the reason that's happening is because I'm, I'm walking in the flesh. There's just no other choice. If I was walking in the Spirit, this would not be happening. The reason that I need my hands cleaned is because there's something underneath the surface that I need to deal with. And here's the wonderful thing. That's exactly where God wants to deal in your life. Our God is a God who purifies hearts. But don't miss it. It's, it's an ongoing process. There's no one-time fix here. There's no like, yeah, we're going to purify that and never going to be a problem again. It's going to fix this plumbing leak and there will never leak. That's no, never going to happen here in this. There's a sense that we're always battling that because he gave it to us there in Galatians where it says the flesh lets against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. There's this battle. But he told us right before this in, in verse 16, I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's like, wait, okay, this is what I need. I need to, to press into this. The moment that that's happening, I need to go after the source and say, yes, cleanse me of what I've done wrong, but let's go deeper than that. Why is it happening? I know why it's happening. I mean, there's only one reason it's happening in my life as a Christian, and that's because I'm walking in the flesh. If I was walking in the Spirit, this would not be happening. And so that's exactly what I need to do. I, I need to be cleansed. I need to purify my heart. These two go hand in hand. Those laid before us, we're not letting go of them. That's actually, again, everything we need to pursue this morning. But just for space, let me put those down at the bottom of the screen. And then take you and, and, and help you understand, again, James is going out of his way. God is going out of his way to tell us, hey, don't, don't miss this. So let's read it again. You got your Bible, so just you're following. We'll just pick it up in verse 8 again, just where we've been. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Yeah, great. I mean, it's just, he's giving us a lot of words, again, helping us to understand it. And he begins with that idea of lament. Literally, it means be wretched. If you have the ESV translation, that's how it translated. Be wretched. 
wretched. Yeah, that's the word that Paul uses in Romans 7, where he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this? It's used as a noun throughout the, the scriptures. This is the only place it's used as a verb. Be wretched. Be, be wretched. Yeah, not just wretched, but he says, I want you to, do, to, to mourn. I want you to weep. I want you to have gloom. I mean, that's his instructions. I mean, that's what he's giving us here, a bunch of words to tell us this. What is he telling us? Well, he's calling you and I to a brokenness over sin, a brokenness over sin. See, don't miss this. Please hear me clearly. I hope I haven't misrepresented it already. God is not calling us to be gloomy all the time. He actually, he calls us to be a people of joy. All the way through Scripture, he calls us to be the most joyful people around. Paul would say it in, in Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Joy, happiness, just this sense of, of just what that's meant to be. We should be the people that have that more than anybody else. Jesus was called that, a man of joy. It tells us in Hebrews 1 that he had more joy than anybody else. We're called to that, and when James is telling us there, he's not calling it to us as a lifestyle. He's not saying, I just want you guys to be gloomy. That's what a real Christian looks like, don't you know? I mean, real Christians, they just, they are, no, that's not it at all. That would be a misrepresentation both of the Bible and of the God we serve. We think about laughter. He even tells us that, turn your laughter in, in, into gloom, and, and there's a sense that laughter, we understand, it's not a bad thing, it's part of God's good creation tells us in, in Proverbs that laughter is like medicine to our bones. I mean, it's, it's healthy. It's a good thing. But the point in all of this is yet when dealing with our sin, we are called to be broken. This idea that James is talking about, be wretched, mourn, weep, just be gloomy. He's not talking about it as a whole lifestyle choice. But he's saying when you're dealing with your sin, when you're cleansing your hands and you're purifying your heart, you should be wretched. <laughs> you, know, you, you, should, you should move into that. Why does he say that? I mean, why so many words here? Is it not because we have a propensity of having kind of an I'm fine attitude, or just a place of, of not really being serious about this, about wanting to deal with this? I mean, it's kind of like it this way. I mean, for you parents, you'll understand. You have your kids, maybe they are, they're like a mess. They go outside and their hands get all dirty and they're coming in to eat dinner and you're like, before you eat dinner, you need to go wash your hands. And they'll like, I'm fine. I'm good. It's like, it's like, you're not good. No, no, I'm good. And he's like, you can, you can get them to wash their hands because they have to obey you. But they don't really believe it. They don't really feel wretched. They don't really believe that they're dirty. God is telling you that he wants you to be wretched. He wants you to step into it and go, God, I, I, there's no way I should eat yet. I mean, I can't believe, look at how, look at how filthy, look at, look at what I am. I mean, I, I, I feel it, I see it. We live in a time that I believe never has it maybe been more needed to be heard. I mean, obviously for me, I'm, I'm impressed. I mean, I, I think about it, that God goes out of his way to just slow us down and make us spend a few more words on this because we might have a propensity of being light with this. John Stott said it this way. He said, I fear that we Christians, by making much of grace, sometimes thereby make light of sin. There is not enough sorrow for sin among us. So one of the great dangers that we are, we're so excited about amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. We're so excited about that that sometimes we forget it's a wretch like me. I, that's what I am. I'm wretched. I mean, I'm broken, and, and, and to embrace that. I mean, I don't know how often that's pursued in your life. David Brainerd was a, a missionary, and we have his journals uh, to this day. And in one of his journals, he wrote write it this way in October 18th of 1740. It says, in my morning devotions, my soul was exceedingly melted and bitterly mourned over my exceeding sinfulness and vileness. I mean, it's just a fascinating, just it's like, really? I mean, here you're going to spend time, with the Lord, and you come out of your time with the Lord, and you're just like, I am so wretched. I am so, I'm miserable because I am so, I'm finding in me a brokenness that's altogether a big deal. I find that fascinating because I just wonder. 
if any of us would have that kind of thing out of our devotions, or if we are so glib, if we are so devotional that we stay at this happy, I just supposed to be happy, and just, just some, and, and not like, I'm just being, I'm being crushed. I'm being ground up. I'm being, I'm finding that in me is a, is a wretchedness over sin. But that's exactly what God's calling us to. Now, we need this for a lot of reasons, but one of them you need to understand is because this is not a natural response. This is not the way we handle it naturally. Now, there's a flow that's happening here that might be helpful to just even watch how it's kind of flowing out in, in the way it happens. See, he's told us, submit to God, resist the devil, draw near to God. If you do those things, you know what's going to happen? If you will submit to God and you'll really be serious about wanting to do God's will, you know what you're going to discover? You're rebellious. You're going to find out how often you don't do what God says. How often you know, there, there's this heart inside you that is fighting against God's instruction. You'll be like, oh, what do I do about this? Which is what Paul did, by the way. It's how he uses it there in Romans 7 when he uses the word wretched. He's looking at his propensity, just his heart that he wants to do what's right, yet his, his flesh wants to do what's wrong. He's like, what am I doing here? See, if you'll draw near, that's what you're going to see. If you will resist the devil, you know what you're going to find? How often you're gullible. It's like, I am so gullible. I am always falling, you know, for, I mean, what, I, I can't believe I did it again. You know, I'm just falling for his temptations and condemnation. And if you'll draw near to God, you'll find out how rare that is in your life. You're like, I don't know why I don't spend more time with him. If God is inviting me into his presence, why would I not, not do that all the time? I and mean, here's the thing. If you'll do those things, this fourth will be the reality that you have to deal with that you have to deal with. But the danger is that you have a propensity, you have a knee-jerk reaction, if you will, to pull back. The, the knee-jerk reaction in our lives that, that when we see these things, when we see what we're struggling with, our natural propensity is to pull backwards. The Gospel of John gives it to us this way in John chapter 3. It says, then this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world. FYI, the light is Jesus. That's what it's talking about. Jesus is the light of the world. And Jesus has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So they're, just, they're resisting who he is. In fact, he goes on to say, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. Everyone practicing evil, which it, you know, is all of us at times, he says, you know what happens when that's where you are? The light shines, and it's kind of like you step in out of the darkness into a bright light, and you just, oh, it's like, turn that off. It was like, you just, you just dim it down. I don't, I don't, that's just too bright for me. You know? and, and, and there's a sense, he says, when you're stepping into this, there's going to be a knee-jerk reaction that you're going to be like, I, I don't, I don't want to see this. <laughs> I, I, I don't, this is really uncomfortable to see what you're showing me. And what he's challenging us to do is to recognize that and go the opposite way. That naturally, you're going to want to pull back from this. Naturally, you're going to be like, oh, who, wants to, who wants to see that they're wretched? I mean, this is, not, this is not something that I ever go for. But God is challenging you to go for that. That when you feel that, when you see that, almost recognize it. And I, I'm just telling you, I, I have a lot of growth room to go in this. But I, I, I see it happen in my life. I see it happen in my life and how it works its way out and, and the ways that God works in my life. There are times when I can just, I can almost feel it and the light shining and I'm being exposed and there's just a piece of me that's wanting to backpedal away like, okay, wow. But I, I can honestly tell you that there's pieces of me that because I understand what he's telling us here, I like, uh-uh, I want to press into that. I'm not afraid of this. In fact, I recognize right now this pain this being wretched is actually going to be really, really good for me. And, and there's a challenge that he's asking you to think this through, that he's asking you to, to intentionally, even purposely step towards it, which is amazing, which is amazing. He's calling us that we should be broken over that because here's what I need you to understand. That kind of brokenness is absolutely beautiful. The brokenness before God is absolutely beautiful. 
It's an amazing thing to think about it and just all that God would look for because I just want you to understand what it is. And all that I want to say this morning, I'm hoping that much of it lands and hope it meets you where you are, but I honestly have a sense that when I was putting the message together, that right here, I, I needed to say this clearly. And it might just be because it's, it's for me, but it might be for you. And I just want to tell you this, there is no safer place in the universe for you to be broken than before God. It's safe. It's a safe place for you to be broken. I, I wish this world was safe. I'll just be honest with you, and you already know it. It's not necessarily. I mean, our world can at times handle brokenness in different ways, sometimes compassionate, other times very judgmental for all kinds of reasons, probably their own brokenness and pride and all kinds of weird things. It just doesn't always work in this world. I hope that we as a church are a place that make you know it's okay to be broken because you are broken. You're a sinner. There's not anybody in here that's not desperately in need of a Savior. And I hope that we provide such a safe place, but I'm not going to guarantee it because we're still people. But I can tell you this. There is no safer place for you to take this brokenness, which you have. You're not being asked to create this brokenness. You are broken. You are a sinner. But there's no safer place to be than to take that before God. But that's the key, is to allow that to draw you. Because see, godly sorrow, that's what it does. It's moving towards God, not away. Paul would say it this way. In 2 Corinthians 7, he's writing to the church there, and they had been dealing with their sin. And they'd responded well to it. And so he's giving them a compliment. He says, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner. He says, I, you know, I, I'm so glad that you were made sorry. Not because I'm glad that you're, I just, not that I want you to be sad and I'm not just happy over your sadness. I'm glad because that did good in you. That sorrow moved you to repentance. And he goes on to say, for godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Godly sorrow is a great thing because it breaks us and it moves us towards God. We recognize how desperately we need Him. We're, we're moving towards Him and, 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 and that brokenness is drawing us there. And I want to tell you, that's a beautiful brokenness. But not all brokenness is good. I mean, we are broken. But there's a worldly sorrow that is more prideful than humble, that instead of moving towards God, actually moves into further isolation pulls away from God, pulls away from people, and it literally can produce death. I mean, honestly, it can literally lead to suicide, where people just, they're so just grieved over it, but instead of moving towards God, they're moving away and becoming more selfish and becoming more just on themselves, and, and, and it can produce that. That's not what we're talking about. Please understand, that's, that's, that's not healthy. The healthy kind of sorrow is a brokenness that makes us move towards God, that we're like, God, I just, I, I, I find in me brokenness. And there's a beautiful place where that would draw that to us, because I just want you to know that God looks upon that with favor. God blesses it. God looks upon that kind of brokenness, and he holds it in the highest esteem all the way through his word. Jesus in the Beatitudes said it this way, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's so powerful, even in that section of the Beatitudes that show the heart of the Christian and just this place of, of recognizing how much we need him. But he says, here's the thing, blessed are those who mourn. Now, the danger is that you can hear this, this is Bible stuff, and it just sounds Bible, and not understand how crazy odd that actually sounds. See, blessed could be translated, oh, how happy. Oh, what a blessed life. And if you were to read it that way, it's a little bit crazy. Oh, how happy are the sad. What? <laughs> like, just, how, how can the sad be happy? I mean, how is it that, that, it, that sadness is happiness? Well, because God comforts those. Because that's where God meets it, and there's no other way. Nancy de Lamas said it this way. Brokenness is the pathway to blessing. There are no alternative routes. There are no shortcuts. 
the very thing we dread and are tempted to resist is actually the means to God's greatest blessings in our lives. He says, you know, here's the thing. I mean, we, this, is, this is the only road. There's no other path. There's no other road. And there's no other way to get to what God has in your life. There's no other way to get brokenness. And that we would resist it is crazy. Because brokenness is the pathway to blessing. And that's what he's telling us. He's telling us, okay, that's what you need. And so James is speaking into us and saying, you need to be broken because brokenness is beautiful. And indeed, please hear me, it is. In God's eyes, how blessed are those who mourn. But don't miss it. I mean, as beautiful as it is, and it is before God, it is entirely painful. I mean, I just don't want to make light of it. In fact, I want to just say it. Brokenness isn't like a fun thing. I mean, the idea of being wretched and feeling wretched. I mean, the, the, discovering your own wretchedness, it's crushing. It is chew you up and spit you out kind of this place where you're like, I'm just discovering who I am. Now, let's just make this clear. You don't have to create brokenness in your life. You are broken in ways that you have never dreamed of. You just haven't figured it out yet. God isn't asking you to break yourself. He is asking you to see it. And it works in la layers. It's as if, you know, almost like an artichoke. You know, you, you find yourself thinking, okay, God, I'm broken. And, he, and you peel back a layer. It's like, oh, this is really good that you're showing me I'm broken. He's like, yeah, we have more to go. <laughs> there's like another layer. And then you pull back that layer and it's like, okay, there's another layer. And I mean, it just is, it keeps going because there's this producing of brokenness. But it, it's there. But it's hard. I mean, it has to be. The idea of be wretched mourn, weep, gloom. I just need to make sure that I'm just not making that sound easy because it's not easy. I mean, if you were to go and make that some advertising for a business, right? You know, sell, sell a weekend. Hey, come and spend $50 and be wretched. We're going to make you so sad. We're going to make you gloomier than you have ever been before in your life. You could be like, eh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's like terrible advertising. Nobody wants that. No, we don't. But in Christ, we do, because it is already who we are. And, and, and we need to see that. But hear me clearly, it's not naturally effective. Brokenness doesn't naturally produce life, not this type of brokenness. See, sometimes people will see it that way. It'll be kind of like that exercise thing, no pain, no gain. You know, you're going to exercise, and that the pain is actually producing good in you. Sometimes even emotionally, people will look at it that way. Disney movie, Inside Out embrace sorrow, you know, kind of thing, and get your full character. There's, there are realities to that. That's not this. This is devastating. The brokenness that God does, it will not naturally produce that because the only way it does it is because God lifts us up, because it's God who embraces us. I mean, this is painful, and, and it's, it's not going to naturally do it, but it's that brokenness that we find ourselves propelled into God, and God's like, that's where I'll meet you. I will bless you there. I will give you grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. I will bless that. And God is telling us that the blessing is him. Don't miss that because the brokenness is hard, but it's good. It's good because it draws us to see how much we need him, how desperately we actually do. With that, understand this brokenness is actually progressive. Can I use that artichoke picture a second ago? Really, it is a continual discovery uh, of how, how much that is true in our lives, of it going deeper into our own brokenness, into our, our own wretchedness, into our own need of this. That's a pursuit that is, is continuing to go in our lives. I think about it just as, as an example. Paul the Apostle is a great example of this, and not original with me, definitely something lots of people have noticed, but I just want to point it out to you. His own self-descriptions are fascinating. At the very early parts of his ministry, in one of his earliest letters in 1 Corinthians, he would say it this way. He says, For I am not the least of the for I, am, sorry, I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle. He says, You know what? I mean, when it comes to serving God, I'm like the last person you should choose. I mean, I'm the least of all those that God would give. About five years after this, he writes another letter, right, to the church of Ephesus. And he says, to me, who am less than least of all the saints. It's like, of all the Christians that there are, I'm the lowest one. I'm like the, I'm the hardest, most difficult, worst one that I know. And then near the end of his life, in one of his very last letters, he would say it this way. 
Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm chief. I am the worst one out there. Now, guys, there's this fascinating kind of progression happening in Paul's life where it, the further he goes in Christ, the, the longer he goes, he's actually going, he's becoming more wretched in his own eyes. He's seeing himself as altogether worse, and that's a fascinating process. For the true Christian who's really producing it, it's kind of funny because at the same moment that you are becoming more holy, at the same moment that you're growing in righteousness, you're also growing in an understanding of your wretchedness. And it's kind of a weird thing. And sometimes it almost feels weird. It's not like, you know, I'm getting closer to God, but I'm just finding in my own heart. And honestly, it's just, it's part of the process because you're further into the light than you were. The closer you get to Jesus, the more that you see stuff that you were totally fine with five years ago or 10 years ago. Now you're like, wow. Has it ever happened to you? I mean, like maybe it even happened like for Christmas and you're like, we're going to go watch this old Christmas movie. We used to watch this all the time when I was a kid, and I'm going to show it to my kids. And you turn it on, and you're like, oh, I had no idea that stuff was in there. Like, turn that thing off. Like, they should ban that. I can't even believe that they would. What happened? I mean, it didn't bother me earlier in my life. It's bothering me now. Well, that's a good thing. But the danger is that it just feels altogether more. And it should be that way. Now, here's the thing. Many of us, we read through Paul the Apostle's words, and, and it's really, really easy to get to Paul's final statement and go, that's me. <laughs> I mean, you know, I hear it all the time. I say it sometimes. Like, you know, the reason that Paul thought he was the worst person in the world is because he hadn't met me yet. You know, I mean, if he had met me, then we could have been like, he would have been like, I'm number two, Jim's number one. But here's the thing. I say that in jest, but here's, I just want to say it as honest as I can. I'm not sure that any of us are there. I don't, I don't know if any of us have gotten to the depth of where Paul saw himself, honestly. I think it's a, a process that God is trying to do in our lives, but I'm, I, just, I think we're probably in process. Probably for many of us, we're still in that first area where we're kind of like, okay, I'm a Christian, and, and God is trying to, he's breaking us, and we're getting to be the place where we're kind of like, you know, I'm the last person God should use. I mean, I'm saved. I'm really glad for that, but you know what? I mean, if they're looking for somebody to pass out bulletins or teach in the Sunday school, I'm like, your, I'm, I'm like the last person you should choose. I mean, I am such a difficult person. I mean, I'm, my heart is hard, and, and, and you're, I mean, you, could find, you could do better with anybody else than you could do with me. Here's the honest thing. Some of us are in process there. We're kind of like almost there. We're almost like, well, you know, there are people that are better than I am. I mean, <laughs> there are other people that could do Sunday school better than I am. I mean, I, I could probably do okay. You know, I mean, it's just, I'm not like the last choice. There are others that are lower choices than me, you know, and that's honestly where some of us are. But God's going to bring us to the place like, oh, Lord, I, you would ever use me? I am, I'm, I'm just the last person you should choose. And you think, well, that, if I could get there, that'd be amazing. And that's just the first layer. Then you go to the next layer where you're not just like the last person God should use, but it's like when you think about all of the Christians where you can say, to me who am less than least of all the saints, I mean, there's not any Christian that's lower than I am. I mean, in this room right now, I mean, everybody is better. I mean, I'm, just, I'm, the, I'm the hardest, most difficult. I mean, my heart, and, and to get there, again, honestly, some of us, we're in that process. We're like, you know what, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm worse than some, I'm better than others, you know, I'm not right quite there, and you don't really believe that you are as bad off as you really are. But if God convinces you of it, you'll get to the being in places like, you know what, there's just, there's nobody in the kingdom of God that is more difficult than I am, that is a bigger sinner, that whose heart is more broken than mine, I'm the, I'm the worse. And you think, okay, that's it, that's, that's, that's as deep as you go. It's like, uh-uh. Paul gets to places, we're not just talking about Christians, we're talking about people in the world. He says, I'm the biggest sinner in the world. I mean, that's me. I am, I am the chief of sinners. I'm number one. That's who I am. There's nobody more difficult than me. I mean, I am the, the hardest. I mean, there's a place here where Paul is seeing his own brokenness in ways that he is convinced that in our world, he's the worst. That's a, it's, a, it's a good process. I just want you to see it because I just want to tell you, I don't think any of us are there. But to the extent that we could get there, you know what would happen? Not only would God become bigger, but so would God's grace. You'd become more amazed at God's grace. And one of the ways that that's really evident is because you would become more passionate about people even seeing that. See, that's exactly what happened for Paul. See, he says this. He says in 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I'm the biggest one. I'm the chief of sinners. 
But then he says this in verse 16. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. He says, you know what? (laughs) I mean, God is working in me, but you know that he's working in me is his hope for every one of you because I'm the worst out there. I am the most difficult person I know. And if God can save me, there's hope for you. If God can work, in, I'm a pattern. I mean, I'm the hardest person I know. My heart is as is, is, is bad as anybody's I've ever imagined. But you know what? In me first, Christ is showing that he is so patient. He is so long-suffering. He will so put up with people. And this is meant to be a pattern so that people could get saved. Because if God can work in me, he can work in you. That's a great, that's a great testimony, and, that, and that's where God is seeking to take us, and there's depth that we haven't gotten to, but I'm going to tell you it's a good place to come, and I would be remiss if I didn't just pause and say this. Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus. I hope this is what you see in us. I hope we can tell you right now, you know what? We are, we are a display of God's grace, and if he can work on us, he can work on you. If he can save me, he could save you. And and, and if you don't know that today, I'm pleading with you today to take that brokenness that is yours and come towards Jesus. Surrender your life to him because I'm just telling you, he can save the hardest. He 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 can rescue the ones that are the hardest and the furthest and the farthest. If he can do that in us, he can do that in you. And I'm pleading today that you would receive that. It's a good brokenness. It's a good brokenness, and it is progressive. It is a place where God would take us further, that we would only discover that, you know, I used to think I was wretched. I had no idea how wretched I was. <laughs> I mean, I am wretched man that I am. I mourn over my sin. I'm broken that, I, that, that I'm over that way. It, it breaks my heart that that's there. That's a good brokenness. Let's put that back together and make sure you're not losing it. Because all of this is saying this in this place where James is saying, okay, you need to cleanse your hands, you need to purify your heart, and do that by being wretched. Don't be casual with this. Don't be, you know, glib with this whole thing. You ought to be in a place where you're cleansing your hands, where you are purifying your heart, and you're doing that in a real way. But this idea of cleansing was, again, a part of a whole package, a package that we have spent four weeks on. And we are at the end of that four-week little mini-study here in in James 4 about what humility is. And I just want to reinforce it for a moment. I just want to tell you, God right now, he's giving you the recipe. So you want to be humble. And can I just be honest? You want to be humble. This is how you get it. Follow my recipe. This is how you do that. See, he gives it to us this way. Go back to verse 6. He says this way, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. It's quoting from Proverbs 3, but it's a thematic statement that works all the way through the Bible, and I could say it this way. There's only one of two ways. There's only one of two ways before God. You're either coming in pride or you're coming in humility. There's no other choice. If you're not being humble, you are being prideful, and God resists the proud. God says, I can't bless that. I will not bless that. And he's giving it to us, and he's telling us, hey, this is something you could do. You could leave here and do this, but I'm just telling you it's the only way it works. If, if you want to be humble, you have to follow his recipe. If you don't, it won't work. I mean, it won't work that way for Christmas cookies either, right? I mean, if you go home today, like, we're going to make Christmas cookies, and you're just like, we're just going to put anything in there, a little bit of rock salt, what else is in there, cornstarch, you know? I mean, whatever you, I mean, we're just going to throw everything all together. I just can tell you, come out and be like, that's terrible. It's like, yeah follow the ingredients. It's like, you can't just, you, you want the outcome. You have to have the ingredients. And yet we live in a generation, and I, I really just believe this. We live in a generation that say they want God's blessings. I'd be like, I just want God to bless my life. I just want to bless my marriage. I want him to bless my family. I want revival in our church. I want revival in my life. And then they'll be like, well, I don't know why it's not happening. I don't know. Maybe God doesn't do things today like he used to because I keep praying for it and he doesn't give it. So are you following his recipe? No. Who would do that? That's so ancient. I mean, do what? Like submit to God, resist the devil, you know, do draw near to God and cleanse your hands. I mean, that just, I mean, who would do that? Well, that's what you would do if you want it. I mean, that's what he's giving it to us for. 
He's telling us, hey, here's the way I can see your, your life being blessed. Do you want your life blessed? You want your marriage blessed? You want to see things happening where God would just say, I'm going to give you grace. Grace is not what you deserve. Grace is God's blessings. You want grace? I give grace. I give more grace and more grace and more grace. But it only comes here. You're going to have to humble yourself. It ought to be something you're doing. And if you're leaving this study, we've spent four weeks on it. And again, but if we leave it informed but not transformed, then what's the point? If we're not leaving here actually saying, I want to be a humbler person than I was. I, 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 want, I don't want to just hear this. See, we live in a generation that isn't really looking for this. There's an old fable that pictured a man, he's walking along a, you know, up in the mountains, kind of along the, the side of a cliff, and just, just kind of hanging out there, and he, you, you know what happens. He slips. He falls over the side. He goes down, you know, numbers of feet, finally grabs onto, you know, just a, a root that's sticking out from the side. He's hanging, and he's looking down the canyon, and it is, it's deep. I mean, there's, there, he could see the, it, it's death. He cries, screams for help for a little bit of walk, for a little time, and then he just recognizes, I'm the only one here. There's nobody up here, and there's no way to pull myself back up. And so, in the fable, because it is a fable, he begins crying. God, please help me. God, would you rescue me? God, you know, you know that I've, I've, I've been needing to surrender my life to you, and now this is that moment where I just realize I have got to give my life to you. Please, God, save me. And in the fable, because it is a fable, God answers. So you want me to save you? Yes, God, please save me. I mean... God responds, so you're going to give your life to me? Oh, yes, Lord, you know I've been wanting to give my life to you. I've really, this, this is that moment where I'm going to surrender everything to you, and so you'll give your life to me. Would, would you trust me with your life? Oh, Lord, I would totally trust you with my life. Please just save me. You, you will trust me. Yes, Lord, I'll totally trust you. Okay, let go. <laughs> Guy things there for a few seconds. Is there anybody else up there? And, and it is a canyon, by the way. It's not like he could just, I mean, there's this whole thing, but that's how our world is. I mean, it's kind of like, God, is there, I, I, I really want to be saved. I really want God's work in my life, but I don't, that just sounds so scary. I mean, it sounds so scary to, to, to move towards that, but it is exactly that, and it's the only way that works. We leave this section, and again, I'm just asking that God would have met you in it, that, that our time spent here in James 4 looking at humility, four weeks on humility, would teach us that. But I'm going to tell you again, it's so needed. This is where God's grace is found. There's only one way. You either are standing before God this morning in pride or in humility. There really is nothing else. Now, we can go deeper in humility. We can go deeper in humility, that's true, and greater in his blessings. But we just desperately need it. I just desperately lead it. So I just want to give it to you as one last exhortation. God's asking you to do this. God's commanding you to do this. He's not going to do this for you. I can't do it for you. You need to humble yourself. You need to humble yourself under God. And God promises you, if you'll humble yourself, he will lift you up. And I just want to tell you, that's a promise. That's a promise. It's not a gamble. It's not like, humble yourself, roll the dice, maybe it'll work. No, it always works. If you'll humble yourself before God, He will lift you up. He will lift you up. So, that's where we're going to end. You can close your Bibles, your notebooks, let's go before Him right now. And wherever that's met you this morning, may it be something that you actually are doing. Would you humble yourself before Him this morning? Would you maybe just become an opportunity that you would actually do this? Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. I, I thank you for the book of James, and I thank you for this section that we have spent four weeks on. Lord, we've walked around it. We've tried to talk about it. We've tried to understand it more. But this I know, this is your instruction. This is your command that we would humble ourselves. You give grace to the humble. And you said, because of that, therefore, we should do these things. God, would you be producing this in us? Would you help us to submit to you? Would you help us to resist the devil? Would you help us to draw near to you? And God, would you help us to deal with our sin, to cleanse our hands? Or would you wash us right now? 
Would you cleanse us right now? Or would you, would you go deeper than that? Would you go after the heart? If, the, if it's just our heart is off right now, if we're walking in the flesh, if we are double-minded and just in the wrong place right now, would you rescue us from that? And God, would you do so in a way that what we've talked about this morning would be more than words on a page, they'd be realities in our life. That we would be wretched. That we would grieve. That we'd mourn that we'd feel the gloom of even just the brokenness of our sin because that's honest. That's real. That's what we are. God, you see it in its entirety. There's no, there's no just doubt or in, just not seeing it clearly. You see our brokenness as deep as it is. None of us probably see it where we ought to. But Lord, you are taking us deeper in brokenness, in a place that we would recognize that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And Lord, that we would discover that I am a great sinner, but I have a great Savior. And God, that you would cause that to be where we are. To that end, Lord, would you just teach us, would you help us to be humble? God, for anybody here that doesn't know you, I cry out for them and just plead that your example of working in our lives would only just give us reason to say that if you can save us, you can save them. And you would do so now, right now, right here. Would you take a moment and talk to God about these things? It is an invitation that you could do it right now. It would be a great moment to humble yourself. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Draw near to him and cleanse your hands. Do that and, and, and discover that he's a God who would meet you. That's where he's inviting you. Just invite you right now to quietly, between you and God, talk to him about that. I'll do the same. And we'll close in prayer and worship in just a moment. Oh, wretched man that I am. That's biblical. That's what you tell us in your word. And Lord, I just come and just recognize it is true. A wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death, Paul said. And his answer is you, Jesus. You're the only answer for, for lives like ours. And yet you are the answer. You're the light of the world. You're the hope of the earth. And in you there is life. Thank you. Thank you that it's true. Lord, take us deeper. Lord, I, I long that we would be those who would know your grace, grace upon grace, more grace. Bring us to humility. Teach us humility. Help us to do that, to actually be actively pursuing this. Lord, we end this study, and I, I just... Tell you, speak it before you again, Lord, if, if we leave here informed and not transformed, then what hope was that? If we're not more humble now than we were when we started, then what was the point? God, make us humble. Take us deeper. Make us a humble people before a holy God. We ask for it together here, and we ask for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
so long and that God is inviting you into that and is working that in your life. Right now, I want you guys to stand. We're going to close with a final worship song. As you stand, I want to say this again. If you don't know Jesus and you have questions and you want someone to pray with you after this worship song, Pastor Phil will be up here at the end of that. Come on up, ask for prayer. If you need prayer for anything else, again, he's here. Others, we'd love to just be there with you. We will come up here if you're here and make sure that you're met and we sure hope that would happen and that God would just meet you today. But I want to just, in my part, just by giving you a blessing out of number six, which is God's name upon you, where he simply tells us, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands, and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. And oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob. God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, O oh Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. And oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face, oh God. Jacob, oh God of Jacob. Oh Father, we come before you and we do pray, Lord, you would cause us, Lord, you would help us to be a humble people, Lord, that we would be a people who seek your face. Lord, we thank you for the study and now just pray that we would grow in this and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.